All right, so today we're starting off at number 90 with Natural Blues by Taj Mahal from 1968. So as most music geeks do, you know, um, we try to explore like other genres. And yeah, there was a time when I, when I really kind of, uh, I wouldn't say a deep dive, but there was a time earlier in my youth, um, in my, you know, late teens, early 20s, when I it started to explore the blues. But at one point I heard uh, Karina by Taj Mahal. And there was something about the sound of that particular song and the way that he recorded it. Um, it's a blues song, but it had a, a sense of uh, kind of folkiness to it, but also a sense of R&B to it. And so, you know, it caught my attention and, and I immediately went and just bought this full album on CD. And I was obsessed with it at the time absolutely obsessed with it i'm as much as i'm like a jazz novice i'm probably even more of a, like a blues novice so for me to even say that i have a favorite blues artist is kind of i don't know misguided but if i had to choose one it would be taj mahal he lives kind of like in two eras at once you know he's just as devoted to the the folk and country blues as he is the electric blues and that's why I love him the most. And that's why I love this album so much. It's his interpretation of those eras, you know, and how he marries them together and lets them live in a, in what, well, when this came out in a, in a contemporary, you know, state and it, and it, and it fit in with what was being played at the time with the blues rock that was being played uh, at the time. At number 89, I have Last Splash by the Breeders from 1993. So in the early 90s, um, you know, I was all a flutter with uh, my love of, of alternative music, right? Uh, as a teenager, you know, I was uh, 14, 15 years old um, in 1993. And the song Cannonball was a, was a big hit, you know, on MTV and um, on the radio, at least as far as like al al alternative radio, right? And to this day, it is without a doubt in my mind, still uh, a top 10 song from the 90s. I, I think it's one of the greatest songs that ever came out of that decade. So yeah, back then, you know, obviously before MP3 players and whatever else, you know, streaming audio, you know, if you liked a song, sure, you could maybe go and find like the single or like the CD single or whatever, but, but more than likely you would just buy the full album. And so I did. And I, and I loved certain moments of it, <laughs> like, but I wasn't like completely in love with it from start to finish. There were just a lot of things that I had never been exposed to at this time. As time grew on, as you do with an album, you, you spend more time with it. You stop skipping tracks as much. You listen to it all the way through and it became something that I just really loved. And what's so funny about it is, and why I mentioned that is because I feel like this album at that age, if I knew better, if I, if I wasn't so clueless, even if I just had like a subscription to Rolling Stone magazine, I felt like it could, it should have opened doors and avenues to me at a, at a younger age, you know, to music that I really wouldn't explore until I got into college. You know, Cannonball isn't the only catchy song on the album. There are several that run throughout it, um, but there's also like moments where it gets really kind of weird, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it tests your, uh, your sensibilities. I honestly just think that this album is one of those albums that's just kind of like the epitome of cool, you know? And it's and it's everything to do with the Deal sister sound, you know, Kim Deal's like vocals. They're almost like um, kind of sexy in a way. And there's just a there's just a sleek kind of coolness to this record. And number 88, I have something else by the Kinks from 1967. So, you know, I might take some flack for this from like Kink's diehards, but I still really am more in love with like the Kink's singles. But there are, I mean, there are outstanding albums by this band. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I fully recognize that. And especially starting with like Face to Face and on through Arthur, you know, um, even I think Muswell Hillbillies is like a, a super underrated album. I love that album. And a lot of those albums have a, a more uniform sound, especially something like Village Green, which kind of has this very conceptual feel. Something else by the Kinks. I just, 
I feel like it's that perfect bridge, you know, between the, uh, the early to mid 60s stuff, you know, that kind of more garage sounding stuff and, and then where they would go with like, with an album like Village Green or with Arthur. And yeah, it's, as I said, it's not quite as uniform in sound, but it doesn't really bother me if, if the songs are that strong. And Waterloo Sunset is just an absolutely perfect song. Definitely a top 10 song from the 60s, in, in my opinion. You know, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about uh, XCC or um, The Jam or, or Blur's Park Life that maybe I'm like a secret Anglophile or something or a closet Anglophile and I just don't realize it. <laughs> I'm unaware of it maybe. But, there, you know, there's a, there's a very British... Uh, nature to this song as well and, and in the songs and in and then the Davies like lyrics you know they're they're uh it's just you know a lot of references that I that I'm still even kind of like learning you know from time to time when I listen to these songs and number 87 I have London Calling by The Clash from 1979 this is again one of those albums that everybody knows so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it I think one of the reasons why I love this album so much is just because of how it genre hops. I mean, to go from their previous two albums to something like this, where they really stretch themselves and really push themselves and really kind of expose to the world, like all of the music that they loved and their influences, you know, everything from just straight ahead, kind of like late 50s sounding rock and roll to R&B, to jazz, to reggae. But ultimately, what I love about this album, it's, it's not like a, um, a referendum on where The Clash stands with me. I'm a fan of The Clash, but I'm not like an obsessive fan the way a lot of other people are. It's not even um, any kind of signifier to anybody watching, you know, about where I stand on punk or, or anything like that. I just love how extremely unique this album sounds, and it still does to this day. It is, it sounds like nothing else, and nobody has ever been able to replicate it. Number 86, I have Let It Be by The Replacements from 1984. Another classic here. Um, I kind of got to The Replacements later uh, in life. It was all of the contemporary bands that I was listening to that, and their reverence, their obvious reverence for this band that that uh, that had me seek it out, seek this album out, and, it, and it's where I started with The Replacements. And sure, the, you know, this album isn't as punk as its predecessors and it's um, not as streamlined of a sound or as con doesn't have as much of a consistent sound as the albums that would come after. I mean, the sound is like all over the place. So many different styles um, from, you know, the opener I Will Dare with this kind of uh, almost rockabilly jangle in a way, you know, songs like Unsatisfied with uh, pedal steel, kind of like a country rock vibe a little bit there to uh, the piano-driven uh, ballad, I guess, you know, androgynous. And even though, you know, the styles kind of bounce around so much, and some people might call it uneven, for me, this is one of those albums that the, the, vari the variance in styles is what makes it so great. And so now, all these years later, after all the times that I've heard it, it, it just sounds perfect, you know, from start to finish. I, I couldn't imagine it being sequenced any better. And then there's all these just like little tiny moments. The one kind of like guitar crunch, you know, of, of like Black Diamond when it really like kicks in, which is just a, a brilliant cover. It's is ironically like poetic, really, because the replacements couldn't be any further away from what Kiss is, you know, or Kiss was, you know. But my favorite little tiny moment is in the uh, kind of anthemic um, We're Coming Out you know, which is a song I feel like a lot of people kind of overlook at times. There's that moment in the middle where it, it, it hits that bridge and it just comes to a screeching halt almost. And then, well, I just snapped, but then that, that snapping starts. It's like, I, I imagine like this, uh, when I hear it, I imagine this kind of, um, punk recreation of West Side Story or something where, where the, the gangs are about to, to clash, you know? I don't know. There's just something very uh, cinematic about that moment. Number 85, I have Copper Blue by Sugar. So Sugar was really my introduction to Bob Moult. In 94, I bought the album File Under Easy Listening. 
which is a great album too. This might be slightly controversial, who cares? It's just one person's opinion, but I mean, my favorite Bob Mould stuff is the sugar stuff. At times, it's just kind of refined, you know, Husker Du, you know, songs, like at, at times, but it really does take on a more kind of accessible feel and, and he was moving in a more kind of um, accessible direction, you know, with this group and kind of why it makes sense, I guess, maybe that was the whole point of, you know, the name of the band name. I should probably know that. I'm not a student of Bob Holt. Uh, I did recently, I was recently gifted uh, his autobiography and I, I'll probably get to that at some point. I just love the melodies on this record, but more so than that, what I love are the layers and layers of guitar. And that's kind of what makes Bob Mould such a great guitarist, is how he uses the instrument. He's not gonna, you know, show off with solos or anything, um, but it's how he uses it. And the different sounds that he creates and, and layering all of those sounds, you know, into one song, like in the, in the studio production, you can, you can really hear it. You know, that's what makes that like beefy, beefy sound, you know, that you hear in so many of these songs. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a Sugar fan. You're not gonna see Husker Du on it. You're not gonna see Bob Mould anywhere else. Like, this is this is it for me. You know, like <laughs> it's just a a fantastic record, and I, and I just love that that period of his of his output. At number eighty four, I have Modern Vampires of the City by Vampire Weekend from 2013. So Vampire Weekend is definitely one of my uh, favorite. You know more contemporary bands. And they hooked me right from the start with their debut album. The way that they kind of combine all of these incredibly brilliant like pop sounds, um, pop rock sounds with, uh, with world influences. And just from start to finish, those albums are just so fun. And that's what makes this album kind of like the standout, in my opinion, you know, is how much it kind of contrasts those those first two albums. I mean, right away, just from the cover. So you feel like you're being set up for something already that's going to be, I don't know, darker. There are moments that kind of seem to um, kind of tease like bigger ideas, like um, maybe even, you know, there's definitely death and mortality approached on a, lyrically on a lot of these songs. At times, almost kind of like religious references, even if they're not really intended to be, um, maybe using kind of like religious references to talk about other things. It's not really darker and it's not really like as ominous. I think it's kind of like the classic example of, and you kind of hear these kind of tropes, you know, especially throughout music journalism, but I, I feel like it applies here. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's that, that mature album. They've grown, you know, and you can kind of hear that. You, you can hear life experience. One thing that makes Vampire Weekend so great is that they they kind of create their own world, you know, kind of in the same way that like um, Wes Anderson does, you know, with his movies. It's only a world that you could live inside, you know, created by Wes Anderson. And, and that's how I feel about Vampire Weekend albums. It's like their own little world that you're kind of like stepping into. And number 83, I have High Violet by The National. So here's another band. Um, now they've been around for, um, you know, a good bit longer than the Vampire Weekend, but another band that's, you know, I would call more of a contemporary band. It's definitely one of my favorites. Very first national album that I ever bought was Alligator. Now I had listened to The Boxer a little bit online uh, because there was a lot of press about it you know, the year it came out in 2007 and it kind of stayed up, you know, into 2008. And so it was around 2008 um, when I when I decided to give Alligator a try because of another song that I had heard. It just blew me away, you know, as the sense of drama. There was also a rawness to that album. And uh, and ever since Alligator, which is kind of where their, their sound really shifted, They've just been refining kind of like the production value of the of their records. And with High Violet, the sound got really, really big. And there was so much press behind this record, and I was super excited about it coming out. Uh, it was the first album of theirs that I was, you know, 
had been waiting on, you know, since discovering them. And it just blew me away. Now the National gets kind of like this thing, this, uh, this dad rock label, you know, like other bands that I love, like Wilco. And I didn't, that didn't bother me at the time before I was a dad. And now I almost kind of like fully embrace it. But with the National, it actually kind of works because there's something about the National and, and the songwriting and the, the lyric writing. It's like they do adulting really well. <laughs> You know, they do adulting in a really kind of like cool way. But the power of this album is undeniable in my opinion. And, it, you know, it's not for everybody, for sure. Um, but for a, you know, sad bastard like me, uh, the National just hits all the right spots. <laughs> At number 82, I have Our Endless Number Days by Iron and Wine from 2004. So I first discovered Sam Bean with his, with his first album. The album that came out before this, The Creek Drank the Cradle, which came out in 2002. And it got a lot of buzz, you know, at the time. And uh, it had some just absolutely brilliant songs. It was a more lo-fi recording. He drew a lot of comparisons to Nick Drake. Um, and you still kind of heard that even into this album. But for me, where this album kind of like moved beyond that was he really started to kind of embrace, um, I would say more of kind of like his, his Southern roots. This album means a lot to me. I I, um, I have quite a history with this album. It, it's kind of soundtracked a lot of moments in my life. This album, um, you know, it means a lot to my wife too. She's a, she's a big Iron and Wine fan. It was one of the artists that we kind of connected over when we when we met. But this album in particular holds a very special meaning to us because of um, this one particular time that we listened to it. And it was the, uh, the morning that my wife uh, gave birth to our first child. I don't know if this is really necessary to say, but it just, it's just, you know, <laughs> my wife had um, chosen to, to natural childbirth, you know, so no drugs. So you kind of have to take your time with things and there are methods of things that you would do and, and just, and there is with anybody, even if you're, even if you, uh, even if you're taking drugs. But one of the things that we just did was listen to music. We just listened to a lot of music and we tried to pick like calming music and you know, we're sitting in the bathroom in the hospital room and she's in the tub, which is something that kind of helps, uh, you know, helps uh, her. And, and I'm just sitting on like this, uh, this ball, you know, like rocking <laughs> with my back against the wall. And, and I'm just like, well, what do I do? What do you, you want me to play music, you know? And, and uh, she's like, yeah. And then I played this album. And for some reason of all the music that we listened to, during all of that and whatever, for some reason, we both kind of have this memory of that moment sitting there. It was like, maybe it was just like, it was like the calm before the, the storm, if you will. And we'll just always have that attachment to this album. And it's just those things. Even if I didn't love this album as much as I already did, I would almost have this on this list just for that. Like just for that, you know, it's just those, those life moments. And that perfectly segues into my next album at number 81, A Sailor's Guide to Earth by Sturgill Simpson from 2016. So this is the one thing that I can tell you where I, I purposefully paired these two albums together in this list. Because this album came out in, I believe it was April, maybe March, March or April of 2016. Our first child was born in January, at the end of January that year. And after my son was born, one of the things, I've talked about this before on my channel a while ago, and I, and I talked about, uh, I guess like, I don't know, songs, big moments in your life, or records at big moments in your life, and then I talked about this album. Because there was this thing that I did after uh, my son Sam was born, where I would stand in this very room, and all I would do is just rock him for hours. I got really good at figuring out how to how to um, take out a record and put a record on the turntable and flip it like with one hand, <laughs> you know, while I had a, a baby in the other arm. That's what we would do. We would just listen to music like all night long. You know, it would help him kind of calm, keep him calm and get him to sleep. And my wife would come get him and take him upstairs. But it was also just uh, the perfect way for me to know how to spend time with an infant. This is something that some people, it's almost like they don't really think about when you have a kid. How do you spend time with them? <laughs> you can't talk. 
you can't, you know, you can't play, you can't do, you know, how do you do it? And that's, that's what I chose. And it, it was, it was great. And this record, it arrived, I had pre-ordered it and it arrived on our doorstep. I didn't know too much else about it. I, I definitely didn't know anything about it lyrically. I, I, I believe they had released the cover of In Bloom, of Nirvana's In Bloom ahead of time. So I'd heard that. And the very first song comes on, Welcome to Earth, Pollywog. And it is all about his son, the birth of his son. That's, that's what it's about. The timing could not have been more beautiful, more impactful. And I'm hearing it for the first time, holding my son in this room, listening, listening to records. Immediately, just TLC, waterfalls, man. Just... <laughs> a puddle of a mess you know <laughs> like and um and uh it's just i don't know the whole album is really uh a love letter to family in a way um there's there's songs about you know being a father songs about they're dedicated to his his child at the time his his dedicated to his wife songs about you know, just kind of like paternal advice that had been passed down to him from his, his father or grandfather. For that, for that reason alone, it's one of my favorite records. Uh, and the timing could not have been better. But on top of that, it is one of the more unique albums ever made. You know, Sturgill Simpson was supposed to be this uh, savior of country music. And he just like said, fuck you right away to that, <laughs> you know, with this album. There's... Uh, R&B influences that run all the way throughout it. At the very end of the first song, Welcome to Earth, Pollywog, there, it's uh, this kind of slower ballad, and then all of a sudden there's this um, this change uh, at the end, and it transitions into this like horn-filled Stax soul. Man, it's fucking great. That uh, kind of varied sound like runs throughout it. I mean, it, it's not a country album at all. That's what's so great about him. He's an artist. He's not some genre's savior. Um, he's not there to give people what they've always wanted, you know? Like, he's not He's not the anti-anything. Nothing demonstrates that more than, than this album when it first came out. Musically, you know, it's fantastic. Um, lyrically, it's fantastic. Uh, and his vocals are incredible. And there's great playing on it from his band. So yeah, I mean, even aside from like the personal attachment that I have to it uh, from, you know, my own life, uh, it's just a phenomenal album. I've been told you measure me how much he loves. When I hold you Treasure each moment I spend On this earth Under heaven I need my Grandpa always said That God was vision And now I know the reason why There is some time Digital gramophone makes no sense. Mm -hmm.